In 1996, a fishing boat caught a man's body in its nets. There was no evidence of foul play until police found someone using the dead man's identity. It is a set of circumstances which is getting more bizarre by the minute. I said there's something very, very wrong here. From the sleepy shores of southwest England, this became a murder case involving one of the world's most wanted men. Brown envelopes stuffed full of Swiss francs, French francs. The whole thing just stank. But one that came with a deadly catch. How do you prove your suspect is the murderer when you can't prove the dead man has been murdered? When there's a murder with no suspect, no leads, perhaps not even a body, that's when investigators face their toughest test. The evidence must be gathered. The evidence must be analyzed. But the evidence is worthless if you can't pin it to a suspect. The only way to crack the hardest cases of all, the only way to prove what happened, the difference between success and failure, critical evidence. In July 1996, a fishing trawler off the coast of Devon, southwest England, pulled in its last catch of the day. The weight suggested the bumper hole. As the net emerged, the fishermen thought they saw a snagged dolphin. But when the catch came aboard, they found it was no sea mammal. It was the body of a dead man. When the boat returned to the fishing village of Brixham, Detective Constable Ian Clenahan was waiting. I was working a late shift on that day. I was the only officer on CID at the time, so I went down to try and assist and, and uh, see what the, the job was all about. I boarded the boat and I was shown the body on board. It was a, a male body. It was fully clothed. On the right hand of the male was a tattoo. And other than that, there was no identification on the body. There was no wallet. As a Devon police officer, Ian was used to dealing with bodies found at sea. Devon Cornwall has got the most coastline of any police force in, in Britain. So it's relatively common that we do get bodies in the sea. Boating accidents, and obviously there are some suicides. So it wasn't out of the ordinary, but obviously uh, it's not an everyday occurrence, so it needs to be looked at and studied and we need to try and find out exactly what happened. The priority was to find out who this man was and what had happened to him. An autopsy found his lungs were full of seawater. This meant the man had been alive when he went under the waves and the cause of death had been drowning. There was bruising to the man's body and evidence of an injury to his head, but no definitive signs of foul play. The injury to the top of the head could have been caused in, in numerous ways. You've got to remember that the body itself was trawled along the seabed for some time before being brought up on, on board the fishing vessel. The pathologist could find nothing, not even his dental records, to identify the man. This John Doe offered the police no clues as to who he was, or when or how he had ended up in the water. But something found on his wrist might, the only critical evidence they had. His watch. Detective Chief Inspector Phil Sincock was assigned as the lead investigator on the case. 
The watch itself was a 30-year-old silver Rolex Oyster watch. It was a self-winding watch, and that obviously led us to believe that um, the watch had stopped due to the person entering the water and dying. Therefore, lack of any movement, would uh, the watch would run down. Research showed that automatic watches like this would stop in 48 hours if the wearer ceased moving. The time was stopped at 11.35, and in the calendar, the date read 22. Therefore, we were looking at a, the death occurring sometime on the 20th of July. The man's watch had told Phil and his team when this man had drowned, but could it answer the most important question of all? Who was he? One of the technicians at the mortuary had actually read somewhere that Rolex watches kept really good records of the people that they sold watches to. That led to the fact that each Rolex has a unique serial number, uh, which is engraved into the watch just underneath where the bracelet joins the watch face itself. And Rolex were able to tell us quite a lot of information about that particular watch when they saw that serial number. The owner of the watch was confirmed as a Ronald Joseph Platt. Was he the dead man? Checks revealed his last known address was a rented flat in Chelmsford, Essex, 250 miles east of where the body was found. We went to the letting agents of that flat and amongst their file on that particular house was um, a reference that they had received, a paper reference that Ronald Platt had used in order to rent that house. Um, now that particular reference had a name at the bottom, a Mr David Davis, and a mobile telephone number. This number was the only connection to the dead man the police had. I phoned the mobile number and I was connected to a very personable gentleman who I would describe as of American uh, accent. Uh, he introduced himself as David Davis and I asked him whether he knew of a male called Ronald Platt. He said he did, he said he was a friend of Ronald's and I broke the news to him that we may have recovered his body from the sea. He was very sad at this news and he informed me that Ronald was a good friend of his. David Davis filled in most of the blanks about the dead man's identity. He told us quite a bit of information about Ronald Platt, the fact that he'd done national service in the army, the fact that he had a girlfriend called Elaine Boys, and that he'd always wanted to um, leave this country and set up a new life in Canada, and in fact had done so. Um, but things didn't go well, and he'd actually recently returned from Canada. Army dental records confirmed the body was indeed Ronald Platt. The tattoo in his hand, a maple leaf, symbol of Canada. David Davis told Ian that the last time he had seen Platt was six weeks previously, when he left for France to set up a new business. It seemed as if the team were closing in on a case of accidental death. It was thought at that time that it must have been some sort of accident, whether he's fallen off a boat or a ferry whilst he's en route to France to set up his new life over there. So at that stage, I'm thinking, OK, we need to put the coroner's file in now, so I'll need something written down from Mr David Davis, because he appeared to be the last person that had seen him alive, and at least that would have given the coroner some information to go on about possibly why he's ended up in the water between England and France. Ian asked a colleague from Essex Police to visit David Davis at the address he had given near Chelmsford. Except that, the officer went to the wrong address. The person at the address was sort of quite interested in why the detective sergeant wanted to interview his next door neighbour. And uh, he said, well, you know, who is it you want to see at the address anyway? And the officer from Essex said, well, I've come to interview Mr Davis. 
And he said, well, there's no Mr. Davis living next door. Uh, they've lived there for a couple of years. It's Ron Platt uh, and his wife, Noelle. The man described his neighbor as an American, just like the David Davis Ian had spoken to on the phone. And he said, well, he's, uh, he's in finance, he's a businessman, he's quite well to do. Um, he's got a yacht down in South Devon. Um, and it was at that point that the officer thought there's something clearly wrong here. And he withdrew and um, informed Ian Clanahan uh, what had happened. Massive bombshell now. We now know that there is a guy living in the house under the name of Ronald Platt, who's American, which all tallied in with, with the person that I'd spoke to who gave his name of David Davis. So was David Davis posing as Ronald Platt, the deceased person? It is a set of circumstances which is getting more bizarre by the minute. In 1996, a body was pulled from the sea by a fishing boat off the coast of Devon, southwest England. Police traced the serial number on the man's watch to identify him as a Mr. Ronald Platt. But then they discovered the man they believed was his friend, David Davis, appeared to have stolen the dead man's identity. Clearly, this moved at that stage from being a sudden death, which was probably not suspicious, to probably something more sinister. Detective Chief Inspector Phil Cinco needed to know more about David Davis. Why would he be masquerading as the man whose body had been pulled from the sea? What we effectively did was withdraw completely from Mr. David Davis, and we, in effect, put him under the microscope. We did every inquiry that one can do to try to get to the bottom of this identity situation. And everything that came back um, showed us that for the last two to three years, Mr. David Davis, as he was calling himself, to all intents and purposes, had actually been using the identity of Ronald Platt, our dead person fished out of the sea in South Devon. The imposter's young wife also appeared to be using assumed names. His wife had been using the name Noel Platt, AKA Elaine Boyce. The police recognized the name Elaine Boyce. Davis had told them previously that this was the dead man's ex-girlfriend. DC Ian Clenahan was tasked with finding the real Elaine Boyce. We managed to track her down and I telephoned and spoke to her and informed her that unfortunately we believe we'd recovered her ex-partner's body from the sea, Ronald Platt. She was obviously devastated by this news. The real Elaine Boyce had been in a relationship with the dead man, Ronald Platt, for 13 years, but they'd split up two years previously. Ron was a very, a very passive, quiet, kind, loyal sort of chap. He, he, was, he was very quiet, very shy. Elaine and Ronald's relationship had ended after failing to make a new life together in Canada. When the police spoke to me on the phone and they rang me and they went through things with me and told us when they found his body and how they identified him. And I thought, oh gosh, I thought this is it. He's finally, he's, he's done it, he's committed suicide. That was my initial thought was that he'd topped himself, that he'd had enough. He'd lost everything, and he just didn't want to live anymore. Elaine told Ian that she and Ronald Platt had been long-term friends with David Davis. And they said, oh, we've spoken to Mr. Davis. And so I said, oh, I said, when did you speak to Mr. Davis? Um, just out of interest, I said, they said, oh, weeks ago. And I said, well, how many weeks ago? 
and they said four or five weeks ago and I just froze I just went deathly silent and I, I and, the, and the detective on the other end said Elaine are you okay I said no I'm not okay I said there's something very very wrong here I said um, two or three weeks ago I phoned Mr Davis but he didn't tell me that he knew that Ron was dead I said so something's wrong here so, David Davis was living under the identity of his dead friend, Ronald Platt. And he hadn't mentioned to his friend, Elaine, Platt's ex-girlfriend, that her partner of 13 years had died. To call this death suspicious was now the mother of all understatements. Phil's team dug further into the affairs of David Davis while keeping him unaware. They knew Platt had drowned two days before the date his motion-powered watch had stopped. So they checked Davis's phone and financial records from around that time. Now, the itemised billing showed that in the two weeks leading up to uh, when Mr Platt actually met his end, David Davis, calling himself Ronald Platt, was with the real Ronald Platt, and they were staying down in South Devon. South Devon was where the police had learned Davis had a yacht named the Lady Jane. It was also close to the spot where the fishing boat had snagged Platt's body. All these pieces of information are basically coming back confirming that Mr. David Davis has been using our dead person's identity. We've got the cell site analysis which is telling us that he was down in South Devon, staying with our man in the days leading up to his death. And also, of course, he had the means to deposit Ron's body out at sea in that he had a yacht moored in South Devon. That coupled together with the fact that he didn't tell Elaine Boyce that Ron had drowned, something was clearly wrong here. A possible case of accidental death had become a murder investigation. But while the police had everything they needed to suspect Davis, they didn't yet have anything they needed to convict him. The evidence Phil and his team had gathered was what the police call circumstantial evidence. That means for everything you have, there could be another innocent explanation. Mr. Davis, you were with Platt around the time of his murder in Devon? Yes, we were holidaying together. Mm-hmm. You didn't tell Platt's ex-girlfriend he was dead. I didn't have the heart. You have a yacht in Devon, so I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. You've been masquerading as Ronald Platt. That's a far cry from killing him. The police knew they needed more critical evidence to be able to prove anything. So what do we do? Where are we going to get further information? And the answer was the house they were living at. Police arrested Davis on suspicion of murder and raided his house. Inside was Davis's wife, Noelle. We found possessions in her bag in relation to Noelle Platt and also possessions in a bag in relation to Elaine Boyce. Davis's wife was arrested, but insisted on taking another bag with her to the station. But one of the officers was a bit suspicious about the weight of the bag, and actually opened it, and inside was £4,000 in cash and two gold bars. The police searched the house, desperate for more evidence to prove Davis had murdered Ronald Platt. We found that he was something of a hoarder. There was loads and loads of documents, brown envelopes, stuff full of 50 pound notes, Swiss francs, French francs, all over the place, and also these gold bars. So what was all this money about? What's all this cash about? What's all this gold about? The whole thing just stank. But could any of this whole prove Davis was a killer? The 
The body of a man pulled from the sea off the coast of Devon had been identified by police as 51-year-old Ronald Platt. A possible accidental death turned to a murder inquiry when police discovered the man's friend David Davis had been using his identity. But with Davis arrested, the question was, did the investigators have the critical evidence to make a conviction stick? Everything they had so far was circumstantial. What did we have? Um, we had a body which had been fished out of the sea, cause of death drowning, no other indication to support foul play. When you looked at Mr. David Davis, okay, he's using false identities. He's told us lies. And of course, he had a boat. So actually, that's all we had. Is that sufficient to prove to a jury beyond all reasonable doubt that this man killed this person who could have died accidentally? The investigators faced a huge dilemma. They suspected foul play but couldn't prove it. They had to charge Davis or let him go and perhaps never see him again. So we were in the position, the, the clock was running out. We had to charge him or release him. And I took the decision that we would charge Mr. Davis with the murder of Ronald Platt uh, and continue with the investigation because we just had a gut feeling that something was really, really wrong here. A gut feeling isn't evidence. But by charging Davis with murder, the police had bought more time. The Crown Prosecution Service gave Phil and his team a week to get the critical evidence they needed. If they couldn't, the charges might have to be dropped. So we had a week and the pressure was on. We realized as a team that we needed more and we needed to keep working in an effort to find different bits of evidence that would hopefully lead to a conviction. What Ian and his team needed to make their case stick was the critical evidence to prove two things beyond doubt. Not just that David Davis was the murderer, but that Ronald Platt had been murdered in the first place and had not ended up dead in the sea through accident or suicide. Where do we start? Well, the first thing is, with any investigation, go right back to the start. And the start of this case was when he was actually pulled out of the water. The police re-interviewed the captain of the fishing boat that had snagged Ronald Platt's body. He told the police he'd been suspicious from the start. So the officer said, well, what made you think it was suspicious? And he said, well, he had the gash on the back of his head. And of course, his pockets were turned inside out. They were hanging out like elephant's ears. Um, so someone had clearly gone through his pockets. And he said, well, if you're interested in that, wait till you hear about the other thing that was in the net. And the officer said, what do you mean, the other thing that was in the net? And he said, well, at the same time I pulled the net in, at the mouth of the net, there was a 10 pound plow anchor caught in the net. Now, this clearly could have been used to weigh the body down and, and is pretty conclusive um, that this could be foul play. So the officer said to him, why on earth didn't you mention this at the time when you saw the officer at Brixham Quay? And he sort of gave him a stock answer, which is an object lesson in police work. You didn't ask, boy. <laughs> Phil's team recovered the anchor the fisherman had dredged up. They were convinced it had been used to weigh Platt's body down. The question was how to prove it. We were discussing this in actual fact at a briefing when one of my detective sergeants who looked after the forensic side of the investigation had a eureka moment, uh, ran out of the briefing room 
and he came back in with a similar anchor, shoved down the inside of his belt, worn like a sword, if you like, um, and he said that's how he was weighed down. And when his body entered the net, it must have got snagged in the mouth of the net, and the body and the anchor parted. The detective's hunch was correct. Forensic analysis of Platt's belt revealed traces of zinc similar to the anchor coating. So it was almost like the anchor had been tucked down the belt and then Ron had been thrown into the sea. So now the police could show that Platt's body had been deliberately weighed down. But this did not yet prove murder. It could still have been suicide. What Phil and his team were missing was evidence that Platt had been assaulted, that this assault had taken place on Davis's boat, which is where they had cause to be thankful once more for David Davis's hoarding compulsion. Among the documents recovered from Davis's house were receipts for purchases he had made using a card in Ronald Platt's name. One showed a chilling purchase. On that till receipt, it showed a number of items, nautical items, to do with boats, bits of rope and things, that had been purchased at a shop in Dartmouth on the 8th of July. The first item was a 10 pound play anchor, which of course is exactly the same as the anchor that we've recovered, having been pulled up in the nets of the trawler. Davis's yacht, the Lady Jane, was impounded and searched. A search of the cabin of the Lady Jane showed a carrier bag. It also, within the cabin of the boat, all the other items on that slip of paper were there, with one notable exception, the £10 plow anchor. The bag itself revealed more. We were able to identify Ronald Platt's fingerprints on the carrier bag. Putting him, or at least an item he had touched, actually inside the Lady Jane. Also on a cushion in the cabin, when that was examined, there were three head hairs attached to a small piece of cellular material. And when that was tested, the DNA was as close as you can get to an exact match with the real Ronald Platt. So we could prove that Ronald Platt had been in that cabin. And also, an expert would say to us that the three head hairs and piece of cellular material had been dislodged from Ronald Platt as a result of some form of trauma. We surmise uh, a bang to the back of the head. So we managed to solve the first part of our problem to prove that it was a murder in the first place. This is one half of what Phil and his team needed to prove. Platt had been on Davis's boat, and someone had knocked him unconscious, weighed him down with the anchor, and thrown him overboard. The second part of the puzzle was to prove it was Davis who had done the deed. Step one was to establish a motive. Who was this David Davis, and what was his relationship to Ronald Platt and his then-girlfriend Elaine Boyce, whom he had met three years earlier? In the 90s, I was working as a secretary for an auctioneers, fine art auctioneers in Harrogate. And in what this man, and he was inquiring about the painting that was in the window outside. We got chatting and he must have been there about two hours. And ultimately towards the end, he uh, offered me a job. And I, I explained, I said, well, me and my boyfriend are saving up to go and live in Canada. Um, and he said, oh, that's great. He said, I, you come and work for me. He says, and I'll uh, pay you more money than you're on here. Um, he said, and you can achieve your dream quicker. So I thought, oh, wow. Elaine took the job and a close friendship developed between her, Davis, and her boyfriend, Ronald Platt. 
Davis gave Elaine a senior position in his fine art company. He said, I would like you to become a director of my company. I was a bit taken aback with that. I, I, I was quite nervous, you know. But he talked me through it and he made me feel that it was okay. There's not a problem. Davis convinced Elaine to become the signatory for the company accounts, keeping his name off any records. His wife was after him for alimony. He said, his wife in New York, she's after my money. He says, and I made my money and I, want, I don't want her to have it. Um, he said, so, he said, I don't want uh, my name on any of the documentation. On Christmas Day 1992, two years after Davis had met the couple, he presented them with an offer they couldn't refuse. He bought us each a book, beautiful big books, and um, inside one of the books was a card, Christmas card. And on this Christmas card, it said, I will pay for your tickets, return tickets to Canada, if you go by the end of January. Ron was like over the moon, he was beaming. Elaine and Ron departed to Canada to live out their dream new life. And Davis started his new life as Ronald Platt. So, when the real Ronald Platt returned from Canada, had Davis killed him to keep his identity? This theory seemed extreme. Why would Davis be so desperate to be Platt's doppelganger that he would turn to murder? The answer was so astonishing that it turned this investigation into an international sensation. At that point, we were just flabbergasted as to what we had. We had to pick all the pieces and all the strands apart to try and establish who we were dealing with and what had happened. In December 1996, Devon and Cornwall police had in custody the man they believed was the murderer of Ronald Platt whose body had been trolled up in a fishing net. Their suspect was calling himself David Wallace Davis. Detective Inspector Phil Sincock's team had Davis's fingerprints checked against global police databases. In the end, we had received a call from Switzerland and the Swiss police had actually identified the fingerprint. Not to Davis Wallace Davis, uh, but actually to Albert Johnson Walker. And Albert Johnson Walker, they informed us, was number four on Interpol's most wanted list. The most wanted man in Canada. Canadian police provided Walker's backstory. Albert Walker was, in effect, Canada's version of Ronnie Biggs, the great train robber, because he was wanted for multi-million dollar fraud. He owned a financial business over in Canada, and he'd swindled millions and millions of dollars out of his clients. It turned out that he'd embezzling all this money, putting it abroad, buying gold, presumably, which would answer our gold bars, which are turning up in all these searches that we're doing. But in 1990, things began to go wrong for Albert Walker in Canada. Some of his clients were becoming suspicious, and his wife bore the brunt of his stress. There'd been a bit of a domestic dispute. He was arrested by the Canadian police for um, domestic trespass. As part of that arrest, he had his fingerprints taken. It's just as well they did, because um, that was the only way his fingerprints were on file. Fearing his financial fraud would be exposed, Walker fled to England with his 15-year-old daughter and assumed the name David Davis. But he knew he needed a permanent identity if he was to escape detection, which is when he met Elaine Boyce and her boyfriend, Ronald Platt. What we had was Canada's most wanted man, a multi-million dollar fraudster, finding out about Ronald Platt, always wishing to emigrate to Canada. It was absolutely first class for him because he could encourage Ronald and Elaine to live the dream, go to Canada. 
he would assist them financially even. And he said, well, don't worry if you've got debts and if you want me to sort out things for you, leave your checkbook and your uh, driving license behind and I'll sort it all out for you. What a nice man. But of course, the day that they flew out to Canada, he now had an identity that he could survive on the run with, a bank accounts that he could launder the stolen money with, and he was completely set up. He could start to live the good life. Bought a nice yacht down in South Devon. But Elaine and the real Ronald Platt hadn't found life easy in Canada. It was the middle of winter over there. It was something like minus 40, which was a crazy time to go. We tried to get work, but it was hard. Um, and as time went on, he got more depressed and morose and it got hard. So I decided to come back home. Elaine and Ronald split up. Two years later, Ronald also returned to England. Broke and desperate, Ronald turned to his old friend David Davis, who had thought he had seen the last of Ronald Platt. Everything was going great until, of course, Ronald Platt failed again in Canada and returned like the proverbial bad penny, and now there were two Ronald Platts. And that was one Ronald Platt too many, obviously. One of them had to go. Finally, the police knew who the man they had in custody really was and why he might want his friend dead. But they were still far away from proving beyond reasonable doubt that Albert Walker had carried out the killing. But the critical evidence that would help them to do this was under their noses. An unfamiliar gadget they had recovered from Walker's possessions, a handset with three initials printed on it, G P. Yes. The GPS at that time was something we'd never seen before. It was brand new technology back in 1996. Two of my detectives are tasked to actually go to the company that make the GPS device and basically ask them, is there anything we can get from this? So we were able to download the information contained within the GPS system, and that told us that the GPS system had been turned off on the boat and the exact coordinates had been stored in the GPS system. These coordinates near enough matched with the position that Ronald Platt's body was trawled up by the fishing boat. Downloaded more information, and lo and behold, the information was that the GPS said that the it was in that location, last switched off on the 20th of July, which from the Rolex watch is the same date as we think Mr. Ronald Platt entered the water. This meant the police were almost certain they could prove Walker was the murderer. Almost. We can prove from the watch what time he went in the water. We can prove that the yacht was there from the GPS. What we can't prove is that Albert Walker is actually on the Lady Jane at that time. What they needed was a witness to confirm Walker had been out at sea that evening, which is where the final twist to this tale comes in. Albert Walker, a.k.a. David Davis, a.k.a. Ronald Platt, had created a tangled web of identities to hide his fraudulent tracks. Many people had been used and abused in the process, including his family, whom he had abandoned when he fled Canada. Except for one, his daughter, Sheena. In England, Walker had been passing Sheena off as his wife. Was this one deception too far? Sheena now learned that her father was suspected of murder. She agreed to testify against him in court. She told us that she was staying in South Devon over that period of time with her father and that they were together all the time apart from one day uh, when he told her that he was going out sailing on his own on the Lady Jane. And he was out all day and he came back quite late at night and she said he was quite dishevelled and quite 
agitated. And of course, what date was that? 20th of July. So his own daughter now could prove, uh, would prove for us, that um, Albert Walker was on the boat on the 20th of July, and that was the final little piece. What had been strands of circumstantial evidence was now a cast iron case against Albert Walker. We built and built and built the evidence with little bits that stacked up on top of each other until the evidence became really overpowering um, and, and proved beyond reasonable doubt that Albert Walker had killed Ronald Platt. The police could now prove what previously they had just suspected. Walker taken the real Ronald Platt down to South Devon, probably invited him out on his yacht for a trip. He took him out to sea until he was out of sight of land, six miles out at sea, struck him a bow to the back of the head, knocking him unconscious, took everything out of his pockets that might identify him, and slipped the anchor down the side of his belt and then pushed him over the side where Ronald Platt sank to the bottom and drowned. Albert Walker had been shown to be a dangerous charlatan with frighteningly persuasive powers. Albert Walker's one of the best con men I've ever come across. Exhibit A in the case, if you like, was the Lady Jane yacht, which was secured at police headquarters. Uh, but whilst on remand in prison, um, Albert Walker sold it to another inmate for £4,000. In his wake, Walker had left a succession of shattered lives. Ron did look up to David Davis, he did look up to him, um, and then look what happens. And his friend, somebody he trusted, somebody he looked up to. Well, it's just unbelievable, really. It's very difficult to actually get in touch with my feelings about that man, because, it, well, I believe he's a very sick man, you know, he's a very sick man. On the 6th of July, 1998, Albert Walker was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Ronald Platt. And he might have got away with this callous and horrific murder altogether, were it not for one piece of critical evidence. And of course he made one mistake, really, and that was not removing the Rolex watch. Because at the end of the day, that Rolex watch, together with the one in a million chance that he would have been caught in the nets of that trawler in the first place, brought Ronald Platt to the surface and really started a whole series of events whereby we identified him and then that led ultimately to all the other pieces of the jigsaw coming together uh, and him being caught for this murder which he thought he got away with. In 1996, a fishing boat caught a man's body in its nets. There was no evidence of foul play until police found someone using the dead man's identity. It is a set of circumstances which is getting more bizarre by the minute. I said there's something very, very wrong here. From the sleepy shores of southwest England, this became a murder case involving one of the world's most wanted men. Brown envelopes stuffed full of Swiss francs, French francs. The whole thing just stank. But one that came with a deadly catch. How do you prove your suspect is the murderer when you can't prove the dead man has been murdered? When there's a murderer with no suspect, no leads, perhaps not even a body, that's when investigators face their toughest test. The evidence must be gathered. The evidence must be analyzed. But the evidence is worthless if you can't pin it to a suspect. The only way to crack the hardest cases of all the only way to prove what happened 
The difference between success and failure? Critical evidence. In July 1996, a fishing trawler off the coast of Devon, southwest England, pulled in its last catch of the day. The weight suggested the bumper hole. As the net emerged, the fishermen thought they saw a snagged dolphin. But when the catch came aboard, they found it was no sea mammal. It was the body of a dead man. When the boat returned to the fishing village of Brixham, Detective Constable Ian Clenahan was waiting. I was working a late shift on that day. I was the only officer on CID at the time, so I went down to try and assist and, and uh, see what the, the job was all about. I boarded the boat and I was shown the body on board. It was a, a male body. It was fully clothed. On the right hand of the male was a tattoo. And other than that, there was no identification on the body. There was no wallet. As a Devon police officer, Ian was used to dealing with bodies found at sea. Devon Cornwall has got the most coastline of any police force in, in Britain. So it's relatively common that we do get bodies in the sea. Boating accidents, and obviously there are some suicides. So it wasn't out of the ordinary, but obviously uh, it's not an everyday occurrence, so it needs to be looked at and studied and we need to try and find out exactly what happened. The priority was to find out who this man was and what had happened to him. An autopsy found his lungs were full of seawater. This meant the man had been alive when he went under the waves and the cause of death had been drowning. There was bruising to the man's body and evidence of an injury to his head, but no definitive signs of foul play. The injury to the top of the head could have been caused in, in numerous ways. 